Um, yeah, get that off my screen real quick. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We're happy to have you at MTSS Fest 2021. Um, first, I want to skip ahead here for closed captioning. If you need those kind of supports, here's how you access that. Um, and then as well, our MTSS Fest sponsors, I want to thank our hosts, uh, Northwest PBIS, Kaiser Permanente and OSPI. Um, my name is Kelly Bolson, and I am the MTSS Regional Implementation Coordinator for ESD 123, and I'm the facilitator for this session. So please feel free to use the chat. If you have questions, drop them in there. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, but let's get started. It's my honor to welcome Corey Watkins to our virtual MTSS Fest. Uh, Corey Watkins is from NERN, and he will be speaking today on planning a meaningful evaluation and assessment calendar. So Corey, I'm going to quit sharing so that you can take over. You're on mute, Corey. All righty, so let me get my screen up for you guys and we'll be ready to go. All righty, so you guys should be able to see my screen now. All right, so. We can see your uh, slide notes if you want to switch that, if you do okay. the swaps. Well, that, what, call that screen. It's been fun today. There we go. Okay, looks good. Much better. <laughs> So many screens and so many things to change with the Zoom. Um, so still mid-morning. Good morning, good mid-morning to you guys. Um, I'm in North Carolina on the East Coast, so it's early afternoon. So I'm glad that you guys um, chose to come to this session. I'm really excited to speak more with you guys about um, evaluation and assessment. So without further ado, let's get started. So for today's session, what we're really going to think about um, when we think about our learning objectives are we really want to articulate a why for measuring the system within, within MTSS, um, try to identify some components of a decision support data system to plan for a meaningful assessment calendar, really thinking about what does an assessment calendar look like and how do we build this out for the year, not only that we have one, but one that's actually something that people can actually use, right? So like, we don't wanna have things on top of each other. And um, also just how do we communicate the evalu evaluation plan and assessment calendar to our staff and to our stakeholders? So those are some of, those are the big ideas that we wanna to learn today. So we're gonna start by just thinking about why should we measure the system in MTSS? So really the need is, the why is really just, we wanna really check on the impact that we're seeing on our students, right? So we really wanna focus in on that. So we ask a couple of questions. One is really just, are we achieving our outcomes? So we really wanna look at the impact of the things that we're putting in place, right? And how are they affecting not only one school, but all of the schools within our school district, right? So we want to focus on that. Also, we want to look at student learning and just any other outcomes. So in other words, if we're building an action item, we really want to really be able to look at it and say, are we getting our outcome? And if not, do we need to modify? Do we need to make change? Which leads to our second question. It's really about improvement, right? If you guys came to the keynote, you heard me speak like I always chuckle and say that I live in circles, right? Like I live in improvement cycles. That's what I've been doing like the last 10 years of my life. So it's really just understanding that we get to checkpoints and then we need to determine where do we go from here? So the work never stops. It just continues. So it's a cycle and we just want to really think about how do we do this? And again, just building effective systems that give us our outcomes, that promote systems change. So this helps us to really do the what or the innovation really well. So again, we're speaking about MTSS. From what I've done in the past and just my work with MTSS, it's really about building those solid systems, having these solid communication plans in place, 
and just being able to really clearly communicate what's going to be happening, what's expected, so that we can move to our outcomes. So as we think about this framework for addressing practice and supports, the big idea is really about, uh, we're really focusing in on our assessment evaluation system, but really what we're really thinking about is the educational practices and the supporting infrastructure. These are the things we have to have in place. So if you look at this figure, you know, kind of as we get look at classroom, where do most educational practices happen? Right in the classroom. I have I used to work and do a lot of PBIS work, and we would say, you know, where should most office discipline referrals come from? The classroom. That's where students spend most of their time. So when we think about educational practices, though the focus is where in the classroom. Now, when we think about it at the state level, what's happening there? Well, we're building out the infrastructure. So when you look at supporting infrastructure, the, the focus is at the state level is how do we build these supports? How do we build the infrastructure? Then it comes down to the region. The region takes the plan and says, how do we make this better? It comes down to the district. We look at the framework. How do we make this for our context? The school, the grade level and classroom and so on, right? So when we look at this, you know, it kind of pulls on each other. So that we have to really recognize that the supporting infrastructure is really about like those state level, how do we build this out to support our educational practices, which really take place where in our classrooms, and our grade levels and so on. So again, really just thinking about when we look at this, it's really like the focus. We're talking about classroom, we're talking about those practices because we wanna have those consistent practices. And we want folks to be implementing the practice to fidelity so that we can see those desired outcomes. So those are things we want to really focus in on. So as we continue to talk about measuring the system, you kind of have to think about some questions that you want to ask when you think about our MTSS implementation. So we think about fidelity. How well are we implementing the critical components of MTSS and practices that are currently intended? So when we're doing observations, are we actually following this? Are we implementing it as intended? If not, more than likely, we're not gonna get our outcomes, right? So one key is just really making sure that we're actually implementing this to fidelity, right? When you talk with teachers and they say, well, this lesson plan is really great, but I wanna add this to this lesson plan, or I wanna take this away. What we've done is effectively changed or modified that lesson plan, which could do what? Have an effect on the outcome. So we really want to stay away from that. So when we think about fidelity, it's making sure that we're actually implementing to fidelity. We're actually implementing as intended. We think about capacity. Just thinking about as we're building these systems and these supports, do we have enough coaches? Do we have enough supports in place for this to actually work? Do we need to go back and reevaluate our plan and modify this, right? So when we think about this, we're about to scale this up, which leads to our next question. How many schools are gonna be implementing? There are 25 schools in your district and you have two coaches. It may be difficult to roll out full scale implementation for 25 schools with only two folks to support all 25. So it's a matter of coming back and saying, what's the best way for this? to be for this to happen, for us to actually roll this out, to get to our outcome, but also so that folks can be successful, right? There's nothing like, well, the entire district's going to do something. And then some folks get the outcome and others don't. And what happens to that strategy? It loses its power. It loses momentum. More than likely, it doesn't stay around. So we want to avoid that. And then finally, just thinking about our impact. If we do the do a good job of building fidelity, implementing with fidelity, building out our systems with you know to support with the capacity we have, and also scaling this up in a way that's smart that gives everyone what they need, we should get our outcomes and we should see improvement. So it's a matter of putting the pieces together and saying how can we make this work. So I'll just give you guys a moment just to read this quote.
data drives everything that we do, right? So without the data, we can't have the information to make informed decisions. And that's really worth thinking about. It's how do we make the best decisions? How do we build out the best plans to support our staff and our students? One thing I always like to talk about is when we think, think about support before we go on is we always say we're student centered. We want to support our students. That is so true. But I think we also have to take a step back and say we have to recognize we have to support our staff. If we give them the supports they need, they will be able to provide that information, the material and those practices to our students, which will give us our outcomes. So it's important that when we always say we support students, we also have to also say we support our staff as far as thinking about moving and getting to our outcomes. So now we're going to start talking about just these best practices for measuring the system. So when we think about the implementation drivers, we're thinking about the three big ideas are competency drivers, organization drivers, and leadership. So I spoke to this earlier, but just a quick review is just with the competency drivers, it's all about the selection of the practice. We're talking, we're spending most of our day talking about MTSS. So MTSS is the practice. Great. Now we've got to talk about well, how we're going to train it, how we're going to provide professional development and professional learning. And also, how are we going to coach our folks on this? Coaching is an important part of this. It's a big key. It's as far as thinking about training and coaching need to be tied together, those plans because you're talking about providing professional development, then providing coaching and almost basically thinking about a preview for the next step in professional learning, but also having those relationships where if you're a participant, you feel comfortable contacting your coach for additional support. So we wanna think about that. We think about the organization drivers again, just really focused on systems. How do we build out the most effective systems? And then leadership, and we mentioned leadership earlier. I think you guys heard Karen mention like the term champion. Someone has to champion the work and remove those barriers so that we can do that. And if we do a good job of those three things, we typically implement the fidelity, which lead to positive outcomes. Now, this afternoon, we're going to spend most time talking about decision support data system. So let's talk about the best practice, thinking about decision support data system. So things that you wanna think about, the big ideas are really it's, how do we monitor our data and how do we use that data to make decisions to improve outcomes? Again, we're talking about continuous improvement. And then we've also got to make sure we celebrate success. I think I've slightly mentioned to you guys earlier that you know school has a begin date. So in two weeks, my seven-year-old will start her first day of second grade. She's excited. She's done all of her summer work packets. She's going to go through the whole year, and then she's going to end school next year. Now, throughout the year, there are checkpoints, right? Those checkpoints are telling us how current level of performance is. Where is she at? Is she on pace to be where she's supposed to be? What happens sometimes is we think June comes, school ends. Well, that's where the fun begins for you guys, because now it's taking overall school-wide data and starting to plan to say, okay, where are we going from going to from here? We've got this data for the entire year. We need to start planning for next year. So when we think about that with the data support system, we really just think about the process. How are we going to collect our data? How, well, first of all, how do we train staff on what data we're collecting, how to input the data, and actually how to use it? The next question we should ask is, do we actually have the capacity to do this? And if not, we've got to manage our infrastructure and say, how can we make this happen? And then again, fidelity, right? Again, I mentioned I have a behavior background. There's nothing like reading an office discipline referral and you're trying to provide additional support to a staff member. You can read and you say, wow, I can tell this teacher was slightly upset with this student when they were writing this referral. And you can go through and you're trying to get these data points from that office discipline referral and you're saying, well, there's, there's not, it's not written in a way that we can get what we need to provide support. So how do we train folks on something as simple as how to complete an office discipline referral? 
so that we can take that data from that referral and provide support if necessary. So it's really important when we think about this, again, it's just think about the process. How are we gonna train folks on how to do it? What resources will they need? How do they actually input the data? Then making sure we actually have the capacity for the data to be put in input into a system to give the information to us in a, in a manner that we can actually use it and make sure it's a timely manner. And then also making sure the actual folks are doing it or actually implementing this to fidelity. You know, we could use attendance as an example. What's a tardy versus a non-tardy? And if one teacher's not marking things tardy that should be marked tardy, that could have an effect on our data, correct? So those are things to consider and think about. So one thing we say is there needs to be someone who's accountable for our data. So we think every school team, every district team should have a data bureau, right? Now, this is their role on the team. This isn't just their job. This, this isn't necessarily their job, but this is their role on the team. So this person is really just the role, their role on the team is to make sure that they actually have access to all of the data so that when we come to meetings, we actually have the data that we need to make decisions. They also can, you know, help coach or train folks, but it's really just about them being able to make sure that the data system is functioning in the way that it is designed. So an obvious example, again, is we're not getting any um, attendance data input on time. That would be a red flag to our data guru, the person on the team who says, you know, we've got to do something, we've got to modify this because attendance data isn't being input at the appropriate time. So we're never, we never have data for attendance with our meetings. So again, you just want to have a data guru who is accountable and understands how all the systems work so that when we do meet, they have those data points with them so we can have educated conversations about where we want to go. So again, just it, just some more clarification on um, some accountability within the implementation team. That data guru, aka data coordinator, their role is to make sure that when we get to those meetings, we have everything that we need in order to make those decisions. So grade level chairs could actually have, you know, when we're having professional learning communities or PLTs with the grade level, again. They can have, they have access to all of the data for the grade level and each individual teacher would have their grade level. So we could have conversations about academics, behavior, attendance or whatever, but we have all those data points there. Also, we wanna make sure that the data is accurate, right? So that's again, a part of the data, you know, the data guru's role is to make sure that training piece is key. You know, I always use the example, thinking about an office discipline for all, behavior is easier to see with this really quickly is if two students get into a fight and we look in the data and we say, well, student X and student Y got into a fight at 830, but they have nine office discipline referrals each at 830. And then you do a quick investigation, you recognize, well, they got in a fight, they were disrespectful, they were disruptive, they were defiant and so on and so on. But the real point is they were fighting. That's why they're in the office. So the point is when we think about that, we want to know the actual reason for the behavior in order, in order to say, okay, this is the reason they're in the office. These other things are things that happen. So when we think about that, it's a training piece, right? So how do we train folks to actually complete the data in a way that we want to input it, actually take the data and input it in the appropriate way so that we have similar data to compare? Because we don't want to compare apples and oranges. We want data to match up. It also needs to be relevant and timely, right? You guys are aware that, you know, an office discipline referral can be written today, but not in put until next week. Well, that's obviously not timely if we're going to have our meeting next Monday and the data isn't input until next Wednesday, right? So again, we think about all the system has to be built in a way that we have data just in time so that we can make the appropriate decisions. So we, um, you guys will have access to this, but there's an example as far as the job, the data coordinator job description. So again, we're not necessarily saying it's a position or job, but it's the role on the team. So when you see job description, don't think job necessarily, it's just the role of that person on the team. So everyone's good with that, all right. So 
we're going to have a quick question. We're going to actually um, take a quick poll. So our question is, is someone or multiple individuals identified for the data guru role? So think about at your schools. And as you're finishing answering that question, one more question for you guys, and you can input this in the chat. What is one action you think that's needed to support the data guru role on your team? Feel free to type that, type that into the chat. And about 70% of you guys have answered that you do have a data guru at your school. You do have that role. All right. So using funding to hire MTSS coordinators, access to all the data systems, a better platform. So as you guys are typing, just some couple, some other questions for you to think about. So one question is, it's great. We've got funding. We've hired all these MTSS coordinators. So they should be able to come in, hit the ground running, and go forth and do great things, right? Hopefully. But ideally, we have some type of training to onboard those folks on what the expectation for them is in this role, right? So that's something to think about. Sammy makes a good point about the better platform. We're talking about capacity, the infrastructure pieces, right? Do we have a platform to enter the data and navigate it? Laura, that's right. How do we define the role so that we can actually support it? Yes, um, Dr. Rankers, it's important to grow capacity. So, like you guys are, you guys are where we want you to be. You, it's not just enough to say well, we've got money. Let's hire some people. It's how do we help those people be successful? Again, I mentioned earlier, support our students. We've got to support our staff. So how do we onboard these folks to support them so that they can see success? Right, maybe, and those are, those are leadership decisions, but that's a great point, is how do we train folks and say, you know, we hire certain people and their only role is, or role or responsibility is to make sure the data is up to date and correct. But then there's got to be some type of transfer so that that data can get to the appropriate people in schools at the appropriate times for those meetings, right? So those are all things to consider. So it's a great conversation. Corey, there was a question in the chat that I just wanted to bring your attention to from Joshua. Okay. All right. Um, question for a K-12 school. Is it recommended to have multiple data gurus, i.e. one for elementary, one for middle, and one for high school? Okay, great question, Joshua. So, oh, this is really exciting because it is just, it's a K-12 school. So ideally, we would say, and Karen mentioned this earlier, when we think about these teams, typically it's five to seven. So it's typically one person. But for this example, when we think about if it's just, if it's one, you know, it's, if it's a K-12 school, the idea is, you could have three. I don't think it would hurt anything because that means one person's focus would be on elementary, one would be on middle, and one would be on high. So then it's it's almost like schools that have multiple, you know, multiple assistant principals and they handle the specific grade level, right? So those folks are they're keen up there, they're educated on what the data points they're looking for at those levels are. So I don't think that would be problematic at all to have multiple at each, you know at a K-12 school of one school, if you said, well, we've got part of our team includes three data gurus because at a certain point in time, that, that could become troublesome for one person to try to manage everything K-12. So again, if you have, if you assign that role to one person for each grade level, I mean, each group, I don't think that would be problematic. But typically if it's just one, if it's just an elementary school, it's one's enough in most situations, but K-12, 
yeah, it, more than likely it would make more sense to have multiple people because they can just focus on the grade level data for the data they cover. It's a great question, Joshua. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. That's that one. Um, now, as we continue, what we really want to think about here is just making sure that data is just available, right? But data should only be shared with like relevant parties. And I, you know, I, I always jump to like the financial piece. I'm not sure that my first grade teachers really care about the financial reports for our school. That feels like a leadership piece, right? So it's really just making sure that the data, it reaches the appropriate folks. Now leadership's gonna be looking at all this data, but then outcome data, that's teachers, grade level team. So that's everyone, but that's also gonna be shared with what the community, because people wanna know how are our schools performing. So we have to think about like, we really wanna focus in on that all the data should be shared with the folks should we're not trying to hide anything from anyone but only relevant data should be shared with relevant parties that's all we really want to think about here so it's not like we're just locking all our data down again i'm i'm sure that there are certain things that you guys report to your state department it's just you know it's it's actually public information so it's a matter of it's public information but how do we communicate what the data is actually saying so again making sure the data gets to relevant parties in a manner they actually understand what we're trying to communicate and what they're actually seeing. So let's talk about some different types of data. So one part of one type of data we're talking about is just a program or process, right? So these are thinking about these are like when we're thinking about our systems and administration. We're thinking about what's enrollment look like. All right. What about staffing? What about the training effectiveness? These are things that we really want to measure because I know schools are I'm not sure if schools have started there, but I know in North Carolina schools are about to start. Staffing is a key. We've got to make sure that we have enough staff to support our students for the school to actually run. So how do we make sure that we hire highly effective staff? Training effectiveness. You guys are at NTSS Fest right now. More than likely, there will be an evaluation. We want to know how effective this was. How can we make things better, right? So we want to think about next year, when we plant, they're planning MTSS Fest. How do we make things better? What do the people say they need? How do we improve, right? And then enrollment. Enrollment guides and drives what staffing looks like, what supports look like. Going back to Joshua's you know, question, now if the school is smaller, you could possibly have one or two data gurus, right? It just depends. So you use this data to make decisions. So that's one type of data, just think about the program or the process data. Fidelity data, really just thinking about, are we actually implementing things to fidelity? Are we following our strategies? There's nothing like providing professional development and then having to go through an observation saying, am I seeing what we thought? Are they following this? Is the curriculum being taught as designed? And that's why fidelity is important. We talk about making sure that folks are on the same page. It's again, it's this is how we do business, but we've got to get to that point that everyone is on the same page. We all function in a similar fashion. That also supports our program or process. If we only have three district reading coaches, multiple schools, I can't learn 19 different reading programs, right? I can't support all of that. So it's a matter of saying, well, Fidelity says these schools are doing this. This is how we're going to support them. Again, fidelity data is very important, which leads to our final thing, data point, outcome data. If we do a good job with our program and fidelity data points, our outcomes are going to do what? More than likely, we'll see improved achievement, teacher retention, increased knowledge. Uh, and I always chuckle about teacher retention because I say when teachers are happy, they stay. So how do we build effective systems that support our staff so that they can have effective practices that would support our students? Staff want to see he is successful. So how do we help them to be successful? And really we look at those outcomes and say, how do we make things better? We get feedback from them. Again, those are the things we focus in on. So, 
the next few slides, guys, we're going to get really deep in the data. So get excited. So um, we're going to talk about, you know, quantitative data, data, which is the big D or lowercase d, qualitative data. So we're really going to start drilling down and I'm um, going to try to keep an eye on the chats because I think some things, some questions may start coming up and some comments. So we'll start by just looking at an example. So we'll start with school A. So I'll kind of talk you through this and you guys can read it. So the big idea is that school A has identified that we have a challenge in our middle schools. That challenge is attendance. So we're gonna problem solve and make attendance better. We're gonna put a plan in place. So the data we decided we're gonna use is attendance, including tardies and early dismissals, office discipline referrals and suspensions. That's the data we're gonna look at to improve attendance at the middle schools right now for this example. So our solution is we, we've, um, we came up with an attendance campaign that includes celebrations for improved attendance and decreasing referrals at middle schools. So what were our outcomes? Well, we saw a reduction in the number of days missed. So that's a good thing. We also saw a reduction in tardies. That's a good thing. But what did we notice? An increase in office discipline referrals and an increase in days of suspension. Now, before I move on, any ideas, feel free, take a moment. Any ideas why we may have seen increases in office discipline referrals or increases in days of suspension? Okay, we'll just give you a moment. If you have an idea, just type that into the chat. I'll give you one more moment. Just again, any ideas why we may have seen increases in office discipline referrals or days of suspension? All right. So students who feel like they get in trouble and don't know why don't come to school. That's possible. Any other ideas? We saw a reduction in the days missed, reduction in tardies but we saw an increase in office discipline referrals and an increase in days of suspension. There we, we got some folks coming in thinking about the calibration of the referrals, increased time in school. If I'm in school more frequently, there's more opportunities for me to get into trouble, right? Kind of tried to um, front load you a little earlier and set you guys up when we think about if I'm in class, there's more opportunities. Whether it's a student pulling someone's hair, using unacceptable language, whatever the case may be, there's more opportunities if I'm actually in school and in class for there to be an office discipline referral or for me to possibly face suspension. So way to pay attention. So how could we make this better? Well, let's examine school example B. So school B says, we've got a challenge with attendance in middle schools across the district. And that's a concern for problem solving. So just some of the data points they're gonna use is attendance, inclusive of tardies and early dismissals, office discipline referral suspensions, but they're also gonna look at lesson observations. How many after school programs do we have available? What about after school program attendance? Crime rates or gang activity? The number of single family homes? Student family staff surveys and interviews. So they're collecting, they're using a lot more, they're using more data points than our previous school, right? So their solution was they're gonna come up with a campaign as well to include celebrations for improved attendance and decreased referrals. But they're also going to combine this with school-wide lessons from guidance counselors and after-school program coordinators on coping with stress and strategies for mental wellness. Also, if we're going to do this after school, maybe we should provide some type of transportation for students. So they're going to have the extra um, bus route for after-school programs, and they're going to also give out free city bus passes as needed. So let's look at the outcomes. 
We saw a reduction in number of days missed, a decrease in office discipline referrals, a reduction in tardies, and um, a decrease in the number of suspension days. So take a moment, and if you're comparing exam school A to school B, what are the differences that you may have noticed as far as their plan to support students? Right, Jason, they aren't just present, they are supported. The more supports equal more success. All right, so we'll kind of speak to this more shortly. Uh, right, Pam. The whole child and positive recognition, looking at root causes, exactly. So guys, time for another poll question. Um, what we want you to do is choose all the different types of data your team has access to. And then if there's not some, if something's on, not on this list that you wish you had access to, if you could type that into the chat, we'd appreciate it. So we've got about 75% of the group has responded to the poll. You guys feel confident that you get academic and behavior data, right? Like we've got access to that. But let's think about fidelity and capacity data. It's about 19% in the scale. Now we talked a lot about how important building effective systems are because those systems support our teachers, which support the practices that provides outcomes for our students. So yeah, we, we get the outcome data, but how do we measure the systems we have in place? Is there any data you wish you had, but you don't? And you can type that into the chat box. So let's see, fidelity, fidelity can be tricky to capture. So those are those observations, right? So we'd have to build a system to use observations to measure fidelity. Is that something that we could learn more about during coaching sessions? Possibly. Capacity data, something else we could look at. Can we do this? Do we need to modify our way of work? So we think about this slide right here, guys. What we really want to think about is just data really has to be useful 
and usable, right? We got to actually have access to it and it's got to be usable. So we've mentioned this earlier, but just there has to be a standardized way of data input, data collection, data input. There has to be a standardized way that we do this and everyone needs to be trained in that. So again, we're looking at same, you know, we're looking at apples to apples, not apples to oranges. All right, real because the data gives us what? It helps us with improvement process, helps us with decision making. So again, we think about the routines. If we looked at, you know, behavior data again, just quick example, if we saw a spike in office discipline referrals from the cafeteria. If we're a PBIS school, what would we do? We would spend time teaching, reteaching those cafeteria behaviors and expectations to our students. Do we do that for all students? Sure, but really we would look at what the data says. And if the data says we're having a challenge with third graders, it's gonna be more intensely focused on third graders, right? So we're gonna probably teach that more frequently to third grade students. So again, we just wanna make data useful and usable. So really making sure that when we collect data, it's a standardized way, it's input in a standardized way so we can use it to make appropriate decisions. All right. And you guys are familiar with action planning, but just really to walk you through it, when we think about data collection, who, what, and when, we would start with what our indicator is, what are we measuring, you know, what group is the data being collected from? Is it a district team? Is it a building school? Is it a teacher student? Who's actually administering the data? What data are we using? How are we gonna collect it? So which goes back to the question someone asked earlier, like fidelity data is tough, but we have observations all the time, right? So those observations can be used for fidelity data. The frequency, letting people know how frequently are we gonna collect this data? who's responsible, that schedule, and then the format. So again, as we've kind of walked through this, it really just says, you know, what are we looking for? Who's gonna look at the data? What are we gonna do with it and when? How frequently are we gonna do this? So again, just trying to think about simple ways of saying, this is how we're gonna collect data. This is how we're gonna use it. This is how we're gonna make decisions. And also, this is how we're gonna communicate it to our staff and to our stakeholders. All right, so we're gonna spend some time walking through year one of district and district MTSS assessment schedule. So as we've talked to you guys about MTSS rollouts, we've kind of mentioned like cohorts, right? The most ready typically are the first are our early implementers. So when we think about this assessment schedule, year one, this is around district level data and initial PBIS implementation data for the schools in the first cohort. So this isn't everyone in our imaginary school district. This is just for our cohort one group. So again, you guys are familiar with the district capacity assessment. So the DCA takes place, there's those two windows, August to September 30th. So August 1st to September 30th is the first window. The second window is January 1st to February 28th. So you have those windows. All right, district installation checklist, starts in September, more than likely, if you guys are like North Carolina, school starts, you have two weeks in August, it makes more sense to actually check, complete the checklist in the four, first full month, right? Then think about PBIS installation checklist that starts in February. More than likely, that's because training's happening from August to February. So once we start them actually implementing, then we're looking at starting looking actually looking at the installation pieces to make sure we have those pieces in place thinking about the tfi so you guys i think some of you guys have used the tier fidelity and inventory so again this is only for cohort one schools you see those windows again and it's just focused on tier one right so we're just walking through what assessment will look like for cohort one schools all right now we start year two. We've gone through one full cycle, right? One implementation cycle. In year two, the district team continues to collect data on capacity for implementation. The cohort one schools begin collecting reading and or engagement data 
in addition to behavior data. And our cohort two schools start collecting PBIS implementation data. So before I start explaining this, I want you to think about it this way. It's a mirror, right? District cohort one has started this practice. We've added more to cohort one's plate. So we're gonna see more information for cohort one. We're collecting more data, right? So we're collecting reading and engagement data in addition to behavior. So cohort two in their first year is gonna look a lot more like cohort one in year one. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm trying to see it. I see some head nods. I saw a couple of thumbs up. So I'll, I'll, that, that makes enough sense for me to keep going. So as you think about it, it's just mirroring. They're just tread. They're one year behind. One more thing to consider. When cohort two starts, they're also getting some, it's going to be slightly modified based on information we learned from implementation with cohort one. So anything that was learned, any missteps has been taken into account with the rollout for cohort two. So again, you guys can, we're not going to read through everything this time, but again, you can look at those windows and you can see how cohort one PBIS installation, for example, starts in August, that checklist. Cohort two starts in January. Does that look familiar when we think about cohort one, year one? Everything started in January. So cohort two is basically, they're walking in the footsteps, they're following the footsteps of cohort one as far as timing, right? So our ultimate goal is to get to the point that everyone is on the same assessment schedule. But we, a way to look at this is each cohort is running their own race, right? Cohort one is ahead of the curve because they started earlier. But cohort two comes in with more knowledge because now there's, there's been modifications to the assessment, actually to the implementation because we found missteps and things that we wanted to modify. But also cohort two has been prepped with more readings. So they should be more prepared to start rolling this out. So I'll let you guys just look through this again. You can see how the data collections set up throughout the year. I'm trying to check the chat to see if there are any questions. Now also notice in April and May, cohort one starts having data reviews, right? That's again, just for cohort one. So this won't happen for cohort two just yet. But again, it's giving you an idea about how we can have an assessment schedule and how people can run different races and we still can track. Now, is this something that cohort two, we need to give them necessarily cohort one's assessment schedule? We talked about sharing relevant data. I mean, this is something we could share with them, but ideally we could just share what their assessment schedule looks like. Because again, our ultimate goal is to get everyone in the same place. So now we're gonna look at year three. The district is continuing to collect cap capacity data. So cohorts one schools are collecting data on tiers two and three and um, outcomes and cohort two begins collecting reading and or engagement behavior data in addition to behavior data. So again, we're talking about how this mirrors, right? So cohort two is still following the footsteps of cohort one, but again, what did we learn last year when cohort two was in their second, cohort one was in their second year of implementation? Those strat strategies will be applied to cohort two as they begin. And that is true. You could have the um, access to appropriate data transparent. So if folks want to view the data. So again, you could have one master calendar as far as the assessment schedule. And then you could just make sure the schools know what's expected of them without you could split the calendar. So cohort one still knows how they're moving. Cohort two knows how they're moving. Now, discipline referrals at this point in time, because cohort two is looking at behavior data those are on the same, that actually is on the same schedule, right? So as we're looking at this, the district implementation check, installation checklist, same schedule, right? So as things, as we continue our progression, we're seeing more folks getting on the same page. 
And finally, this is just year three continued. All right. And now we're at year four. So once we get to year four and everyone's on the same page, obviously it looks very similar because it's exactly the same. The assessment schedule is the same for everyone in the school district. Cohort one and cohort two schools are all on the same page. So now that we've done all that, we've got everyone on the same page, what are we really thinking about? So we've got to really figure out how we want to make decisions, right? We're going to break the data down. We're going to analyze the data. We're going to summarize it at least quarterly. But we think about that. Now we've got all this data. We've broken it down. We've got to communicate it in a way that folks will understand. So what, what are we going to share with our staff, with relevant staff? How are we going to build the action plans from what the data tells us? And then how do we share this with the stakeholders? So I think when we go back and think about those examples of school A and school B with the attendance changes, it's easier to explain. This is what we did. These are the outcomes. This is what we see. And I think folks really, again, we mentioned earlier, people like success. And when they see improvements, positive things are stated about the schools. So again, our school districts making these decisions, using data to make decisions is important, but it's not as much just, it's not just we made the decision, it's how do we plan? Which leads us to plan, do, study, act, right? We think about our PDSA, PDSA cycles, which are really just, it's a small scale, you know, test of change. It kind of mirrors the scientific method. So let's think about it this way. I just showed you guys an assessment schedule, right? Cohort one, cohort two, years one through three, one through four, right? If you look at the first circle, excuse me, go back. So if you look at our first plan, do study act, that's cohort one. We implemented a plan if you get, and we can go back and read that, but that was, when we think about the assessment schedule, this is what the plan's about. We're gonna implement it. The study piece is actually like the assessment schedule. It shows when those checkpoints are, right? Now we're looking at the act portion. Do we stay with what we have? Do we make modifications? How do we make this better? When year two starts, we look at our second improvement cycle using PDSA. Now cohort two has come on board. They're using the same plan as far as the learning from cohort one. But now cohort two is just trailing as far as the amount of things they're going to be collecting. We do plan, do study act. We've implemented the plan. We got a plan. We do it. We're implementing it. We study. We look at our outcomes. We make decisions. We act. We get to year three. We've added cohort one gets a little more. Cohort two is now in what would, would have been the second cycle for cohort one. They've gotten more. We implement the plan. We actually do it, we study it, we act, we make decisions. Till we get to the fourth plan, do study act for our improvement cycle, we're making decisions, that's year four. So if we can go back and think about that assessment schedule, we got to year four, we're all on the same page, we're all planning, we're implementing our plans, we're looking at outcomes and we're making decisions. So when I always, when I say I live in circles, I get to talk about PDSA cycles a lot as well. So here I am again, talking about circles. But again, just recognizing the study portion is we're actually looking at our data. So if we thought about the assessment schedule, we're looking at those data points throughout to make decisions. And then at the end of the year, we make the final decisions. Did the modifications we make show improvement? Now we start acting or building the action plan based on that data. And we continue this. So again, it's continuous from this point along. At this point, at the point of year four, we would hope we're at full implementation. All right. 
Now, we mentioned earlier just equity. So things to remember with equity is again, we want to just um, check for assumptions of limited beliefs and ability of reviewing data. So we want to avoid, you know, watch out for confirmation bias, just avoid like poverty, discipline, color blindness, and deficit thinking. Right. So we really want to make sure that we consider equity when using the data and making sure that when we make decisions, they impact all, including the voices that might not be represented at the table or those folks who are like, who have been marginalized historically. So just remember those things as we're going through. Okay. So make sure we have those equity considerations in place. And as we get ready to wrap up, we're going to talk quickly about communication. Again, we mentioned that we can collect all this data, but how do we, we need to actually communicate to folks what we're seeing. So we want to make sure it's scheduled regularly. There's a process. We have dedicated times and opportunities to make changes. So typically we think of it this way. We can look at our data, PLCs look at data weekly, school improvement teams, Look at data monthly and quarterly, and we make decisions. While that's happening, our district teams are also looking at data monthly and quarterly because we want to see what the progression looks like. And then we want to make sure that we're giving the appropriate feedback to our staff who are actually implementing those practices to our schools to see about what, what we're seeing as we're continuing this improvement cycle. And then also sharing information with families and other stakeholders, right? So we want to make sure that we're letting folks know where we are. All right. We think about it. How will we communicate the data to staff and stakeholders? Again, we kind of talked around PLCs using data weekly and just using the data to make decisions monthly. But those reports to the school board and the community are important because we want them to know what we're doing where we're going and what our goals are and how we're moving towards reaching. So as we get ready to wrap up, guys, there's one final poll. I know you've, you've been waiting for this all day for the final poll. So with this poll, how often does your MTSS team review data and make decisions using data for your system? And we aren't taking names, so there is no wrong answer, guys. And I'll give you another moment to answer the poll question. Also in the chat, um, if you have one idea about an action your team could take to improve its process for using data, we'd appreciate it if you'd share. And Pam, I see you have a question about data. Typically, once we put an intervention in place, we would think four to six weeks, <clears throat> right? So four to six for, the actual, you're actually implement, implementing the intervention and then retesting to see what their current level of performance is to determine if that's enough intervention, right? Right, if that's the appropriate dosage or if it's the correct intervention. So I hope that's helpful. All right, and as we look at our poll, we've got um, most groups think they look at the data quarterly. Most of you guys say quarterly. So it's a matter of like, again, this all goes hand in hand. So it all ties together. So ideally PLCs are looking at, we're looking at data weekly, school teams, improvement teams are looking at it monthly and quarterly. It's all a progression so that we can, again, monitor how we're moving. So as we get ready to wrap up guys, since we're, we spoke so much about progressions, um, just want you to remember to believe in the possibility. So there's a seedling growing out of the ground. Um, 
you didn't just put that and plant that in the ground yesterday and it's growing today. You actually have to plant it, you have to nurture it, you have to provide it some water, some sunlight for it to grow and it takes time. So understand that you guys can do this. It's just a matter of time and making sure we put the things in place for us to see our outcome. So um, glad that you guys were able, able to attend. Um, hopefully I've been able to answer your questions. Um, see a few more chats. Um, not follow on the data rich, next step poor, right? Right, let's not admire the data like, oh man, our test scores are really low. Let's don't, you know, let's not, you know, let's not admire problem data, but let's be problem solvers. So um, I appreciate everyone for attending and hopefully today you've learned something from this session and um, it was exciting to be with you guys in the state of Washington. Thank you, Corey. Do you mind if I share my screen real quick? Of course, no problem. Just wanna give people some, some nuts and bolts that they might need as they exit the session. Um, Hopefully you're all able to see that. If you have questions that we weren't able to answer, you can email those questions to Cicel at k12.wa.us. And just in the subject line, if you put the presenter's name or the session title, that'll help to get the questions you know, pushed out to where they need to go. Um, I saw in the chat way earlier a question about presentation materials, and those will be ready on August 18th um, on the OSPI website. There's the info on clock hours. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll hang out on here for a few minutes, but otherwise, thank you guys so much for attending. Appreciate it. And thank you for the great information, Corey. Thanks for having me.